Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves going this morning. Um, welcome. <laughs> First off, uh, I'm Glenn Katz. Uh, thank you for joining us in 120A or some variation thereof. Um, and be willing to take it like in an online form, kind of a hybrid form where we're trying to offer and make the course available to people off quarter so that as different people have uh, scheduling constraints and different things they have to work around in their overall academic plan, you can still hopefully get most of the value of the content. In some, in some ways, I think it's actually better to get it this way, um, kind of in a really compacted form where you're working on your own, but we also want to try and set it up so that you know we have some interaction as a group and kind of move, move together as a cohort and kind of support each other and you know, just try and just work together. I think it's sort of hard and challenging to sort of work on things online in that you can kind of do it at your own pace, which is really kind of cool. So you can watch it at night or whenever it sort of makes the most sense. But you sort of lose, you know, there's an intimacy and a support that comes from actually being in the room and kind of sharing the problems together and stuff like that. So that's why we're going to try and offer a session every week to, even though you're watching a lot of it online, if it's if you want to and yeah, it's, it's in your schedule and stuff like that. You can come and just meet and kind of like uh, just go sync up on what's going on in the videos, what was confusing, what you need some extra help with, and like all those little details. Because in this class, there really are a lot of details in terms of um, software and stuff flying around. But somehow it's a worthwhile thing to sort of learn because it sets you up very, very well for the future in terms of like uh, architecture and engineering building and stuff like that. So I record everything, and we're recording this too for people who can't be here this morning. So whenever you're hanging around here, watch out, the microphone is on. So <laughs> like uh, that stuff does get captured, but uh, that's generally pretty good. But how about this, before as we get started, go ahead and tell me about yourselves. Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll start with me. I'm Glenn, I've been teaching here for a lot of years in civil engineering. Um, I am actually a civil engineer by trade, but I started in architecture, kind of switched over to civil engineering kind of late in it. I'm always sort of torn about really which one I like. I sort of like both. I like everything about buildings. And you know, a lot of people kind of in this class often sort of struggle with that too. Because if you like buildings, this is a good place for you. Whether you're going to be designing them, doing the structure for them, planning the construction of them, or uh, developing and creating buildings for people to be using, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's, we all sort of end up working with these building models as a way of communicating. So tell me about you guys. So who are you? And like, uh, let's go ahead and share. Yeah. yeah. I'm Bruna Franos. I'm um, a sustainable design construction instructor's co -term. Um <clears throat> And I'm, I really like BIM. I don't have much experience mm -hmm. with it. I'd like to get more practice with it. Um, to get really good, and I don't know, I just think that BIM, like, it's fascinating to me that just, like, doing a sketch of a building, like, even on SketchUp, right, it, you start thinking about, oh, shoot, like, you need space for this, and, like, you know, these little details that you could really prevent um, problems out in the construction um, site, so. It all becomes very real when you start sketching it out and start showing up in 3D, and it's amazing how realistic this representation of it is in comparison to the real thing. I'm always sort of struck for myself even when I do modeling of buildings. I have a design practice in San Jose where I model buildings and then I'm actually visiting them on site with homeowners and just, you know, to me it feels like I've been through this building already. It's just been, <laughs> you know, now it's just actually physically real. Yeah, you, you took 183 already or? I'm in. You're waiting for it now. Got it. So as part of that, are you taking, like, is it still going to be, last time it was a boot camp session where Derek yeah, did something with SketchUp? Yeah, we SketchUp a lot of SketchUp. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So you're working with that. And yeah. So supplement all that. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And you are? My name is Bianca. I'm a junior undergrad um, in environmental systems engineering. I travel into the urban environments. And, uh, like, pretty broad scope within my major, but uh -huh. I've heard amazing things about this class in, in um, CEE 100, which is my writing in the major, uh -huh. uh, managing sustainable building projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one homework assignment where we were, like, walked through a very, we were walked through right, Reddit at a very cursory level. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was really cool, and a lot of jobs I'm trying to apply for 
want to see that you have experience with Revit. Yep. So, uh, interested in the learning. Very good, very good. I think you, you touch on sort of a very kind of good important point. It, yeah, in general, it's, we do have a lot of fun in here. This is one of these really interesting classes where we're going to sort of learn about a tool, but we're going to do it in the context of doing a lot of design assignments. And those design assignments are very, very customizable. For each of them, I have a prompt, kind of a description of the type of building, you know, just to kind of give you something to work on so that you're not sort of designing in space. Um, they're all very adaptive, though, too. So I should comment on that as you read the assignments. If, well, that sounds kind of interesting, but I would like to do something just a little bit different because it would be more interesting to me. Please propose it. That's okay. You know, it's part of the freedom and the flexibility about being a real small class and doing it in a very individualized way. So definitely feel free to do that. Um, as we go, what? This whole notion that this is a very useful job skill is certainly true. In fact, that's actually how we got started even teaching Revit around here, was that uh, just uh, so the architecture program, more and more, you know, people were starting to ask for, oh, you know, do you have good AutoCAD skills? Can you do something like that? And then it evolved as the technology evolved and what people were using in the field. So now it's really, do you have Revit skills? So it's kind of become one of those things, everyone should know how to do just a little bit of it because it's like knowing a foreign language. You could have a survival level, and you just need that to sort of uh, be part of that workplace and you know, participate. But yeah, some people get really, really good at it and push it deeper. So even, as you count, this course, A, is really, it's kind of the beginning of a sequence. This is the one where I'd say, if we were like in foreign language, this is where we're learning basic vocabulary. Okay, we're learning all the essential sort of ways of creating walls, doors, windows, and all the different pieces and kind of thinking about how those get put together into a building. Um, as we keep on going, there's a B and a C class. In the B class, we go a little further in terms of saying you're gonna work on the design of a single building throughout the entire quarter, but you're gonna think about the structural, the mechanical, plumbing, and electrical systems, how they all work together in kind of a very holistic way. So it just kind of takes it a little bit further. And in C, what we do is, we uh, go through and we say that if you have models that can be controlled parametrically, that you can kind of programmatically reshape and reform, could we automate that to go through and consider a lot of different variations and options and try and figure out really what one of the best or the best options might be depending on the criteria you're looking for. So there's a whole sequence going on here. Um, we will organize ourselves, uh, well, there's a couple different ways to kind of do it. Basically, a lot of what's available online is available through the Canvas system. So I'm only gonna walk through that and we'll talk about your machines and computers and all that kind of stuff and just where you can find things and all that. So um, you should all be in Canvas, I think you guys both are, in oh, just the uh, 120S class. I'll always, yeah, and don't let this confuse you. I'll always refer to you as 120A students even though you're taking it under the S number because that's just kind of what you're really doing. Okay, the S number just I said you use for a lot of different things. Okay, so if I go to BIM Special Studies and probably one of the easiest ways to find it is, let's see if I can do it under this, either the syllabus or the calendar. If you go through the syllabus, you'll actually find, this is just really all the different class sessions kind of strung on out. You'll also find them in the calendar. They're kind of hanging around in the calendar, although they don't have a class time, so they show up at midnight or something like that. So they usually show up at the top of the screen up in here. But then for each of the different class sessions, we kind of roll back to the first week. Yeah. If you go click it on that, you'll find links to the video recordings from that session, as well as whatever we handed out during that session. So you should be able to find everything that coordinates with what went on in the videos and what goes on in the class. In this case, in the first class, there was stuff about the syllabus, the course logistics, and just some examples of uh, you know, different Revit models that people opened up to go ahead and take a look at what just building models are kind of like. So you'll always kind of find stuff out there. Okay, so do you want to sort of find it that way or again to the syllabus way? Either way sort of works. Although in the syllabus way, I'm realizing now I should put session numbers on things. Let me pop out here again. Okay. You'll also find the files in another way, just under the files section in Canvas, under the folder 228 content, 
everything's just loaded up that way in terms of session one all the way through and the different assignments. So everything you need hopefully will be out there. But again, if things are missing out there, just let us know. There's just always something that's missing in terms of uh, getting at what you need. So um, you know, just let us know and we will kind of keep on plugging away. Make sure to take care. Yes? I like you have know assignment seven up there, but I only have like six. Say what? Oh, you only see through six? Yeah. I believe that's because what we've done in the past is yeah, you know, when we do the class as a big group, assignment seven is kind of a group thing where people work together to design like a shopping center complex. Um, for six, what we did was, I think it's probably still that way, um, we finished up, or, or for any individual folks, we finished it up with like a parametric design problem. So we just swapped in something different at the end. Okay. So don't feel bad if you don't see it. That's just, yeah, I think we adapt a little bit because usually we end up starting a little later and all that kind of yeah. stuff. But I'll share assignment seven with you because it's actually kind of a fun one. Yeah. It's actually just you know, kind of an interesting one. If you've ever been to, you've been to the, it's uh, San, San Antonio and El Camino, there's what used to be called uh, the San Antonio Center. Now there's actually like a whole shopping, shopping village. Center. Yeah, yeah, so you get to play with that site. And it's actually kind of a cool project. Because really, what happens in here is the projects sort of build and kind of get oh, a little more elaborate as you go on through. Let me just kind of show you where you can find those under assignments. You can find all those, everything from the field research station, which is a little 500 square feet building. The idea is to kind of build something that could be out at Jasper Ridge as a temporary place for people to work um, while they're in the field, have some desks, a restroom, a little lab space to kind of work with. Um, it moves on through, there's a vacation house where you design a kind of a weekend vacation stay place for Lake Tahoe. Uh, and uh, kind of think about start doing multi-story buildings. In assignment three, you take that same vacation house and you uh, do a little rendering on it. You apply lights and materials and try to set up you know, different visualizations to kind of make it really easy to go through and uh, see what the house is going to be like and explain it to your clients. In four, you actually put together a building which I call an engineering student commons. You could sort of think about it being um, if the Long Center hadn't been built, what an engineering student center should be like. So meeting spaces for students, cafes, some classrooms, some computer clusters, just kind of buildings that are sort of very familiar to you. Five, you actually build a structure for your building. Okay, six here is the integrated design one. Actually, even this is like the little sink, kind of sink, I'll work with that. This is the integrated design one. That's the shopping center project. So. If that's not available to you in the other location, we'll kind of shift it around. But again, just go ahead and get started with one, two, three, four, and we'll get going on that. Okay, all these assignments, they're kind of hanging around out there. I should comment, they don't have due dates kind of on them, at least in terms of the Canvas system. So you can go ahead and turn them in really at the pace that you want to. I think if you go through and you read the assignments, I think if you even read the PDF, it probably does have a due date on it. But really, I'll adjust all those. Yeah, this was back in, you know, so this was about a week into the quarter or something like that. That's when it was originally due, you know, back during the uh, fall quarter. Um, I'll go ahead and give you a schedule of sort of suggested dates, just to kind of help pace yourself. Because about the only way to get in trouble in this class is really to just sort of fall behind and then let the wave start getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's good to kind of just keep a pace. Can you suggest about a week for each assignment? It'll, the first one's a good week one. So, like, you know, if we're getting together next week, go ahead and try to have assignment one. Too. That'll be a good goal for that one. Uh, it just sort of varies, a week to a week and a half. It just kind of sort of varies a little bit. And then in terms of how we'll actually do this, you know, we're going to go through and work in a couple different ways. We'll go ahead and have the weekly sessions just to go through and have an opportunity to meet and share and ask questions. In terms of looking at your assignments, uh, one of the graduate students, Pratt, who uh, is in the STC program, you may know him, he uh, came up with a very innovative way that I really like doing the, the grading or the kind of feedback on the assignments. We just do it individually. And as opposed to being a grading session, think of it this way. It's more like you're checking in the assignment and I'm giving you just sort of advice about really how you could make it better. 
Okay, so it's really just all, oh, okay. This is really cool. Now for that, what if you presented it this way? That might make it a little bit clearer. You know, so generally people do okay in this class. It's really, I, I don't want you to feel that there's a lot of grading pressure. For the most part, you're learning skills and we're all on different journeys. I should comment on that. Some of you are really good designers. Some people are not as kind of creative as designers, but still very solid modelers. And it's okay. You know, everyone's just sort of on their own journey. And what we try to do is just really kind of get you all through it. But so for the most part, don't feel like there's a lot of grading pressure. As long as you go through and kind of get things done, and you're sort of moving through and get things completed, you're going to do OK. OK, because it's really, this is much more about learning skills that are going to support you in all your other classes, where then you're going to go have to exercise them with great excellence. But this is really all about just helping you guys get through it. Okay, so. Um, that's where all the assignments are and stuff like that. Let's talk a little about just random logistics things. Okay, um, this room. Uh, do you know the code to this room? Okay, so you're both good on that in terms of getting in here after hours. That's super. And you have access to the building after hours and all that. Okay. I still need to like fill out this the star or do the stars course yes. to get access to this ah. building. But, uh, <laughs> Is that the, is there a new code for this room? Is that it? No, no, no. Okay. It's, it's the old one. The old one's still... It's six digits. Yeah, it, has, it hasn't changed in okay. eight years or something like that. Okay. <laughs> it's been a long time. Oh, it's a top secret. Uh, the course is funny. We didn't just have to take the course. Do it. It's, it'll take you like an hour and a half yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And it, It's actually pretty easy with all the safety training questions. It's like, it's, you know, they have you read a lot, but it's, it, it works okay. So that'll be good. That'll get you on the list there. Okay. Um, so all the software you need is available on these machines, and these machines are great generally. The problem with these machines is that on certain crowded class assignment days, it's just hard to get in here because people are completing things for other subjects you may be in. So it's really good if you can to sort of set up your own computer to kind of work with the software. And in terms of doing that, you got a Mac, I see. What kind of computer do you have? My computer fell on the floor last week That's and died. Oh, okay. So I don't have one until I get the money to fix it. No worries. So you may be working in the lab. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I live close by. Um, I know AutoCAD has free software for students. Yes. Right? Um, but they do they only have AutoCAD for Mac um, and not Revit for Mac? You're correct on that, but let's talk about how we're going to work around that. Because, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, let's see, I'm in the same boat. I got a Mac yeah. over here too, and have been using it this way. I used to even work for Autodesk for a while and did all my stuff on a Mac. Okay. Here's how you got to do it. Okay. Um, if you have a Mac as opposed to a PC, if you have a PC, it, a Revit software runs on the PC, 64 bit machine, it'll just sort of work. Okay. On the Mac, It'll run, but what we need to do is install Windows in a partition somewhere. And some people do it through Boot Camp, some people do it through Parallels. I prefer to do it through Parallels, because with Boot Camp, what you have to do is basically restart your machine as a PC, restart your machine as a Mac, and you're kind of doing one or the other. Whereas with Parallels, let's see if it's even there. There it is right there. Okay, so. Yeah. There's Revit kind of hanging around on the uh, Mac side, or the PC side. There's the Mac, and you, know, you can just swipe back and forth. So it's a good system, but the limitation is you have to have some memory to make it work. Yeah. So how much memory do you have? RAM. How much RAM do you have? And if you have little, I'm going to invite you that you might be good to say, say about. Let's see what we got here. We got 16. Oh, you are fine. Oh, 16 also. 16, so yours works fine. Oh, yeah, exactly. Partition so eight. we're going to partition eight. eight. Exactly. Yeah. And how much disk space do you have? Space. So go to like one of your folders, just add in the file. Oh, looks like you got plenty. So you got 300 gigs free. Okay. Super. You're going to set up a partition. You know, Parallels will let you sort of set one up that will grow as it needs. So set it up originally, oh, for like, you know, 80 gigs or something like that. And it will grow as necessary. I have a lot of stuff, so mine's up to like oh, 120 or something like that. But you got room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you are going to be just fine in terms of what's going on. Okay. Is this a, this is a relatively new machine? Yeah. Okay. When you set it up, there's going to be one little thing in Parallels I'm going to warn you about. 
That's going to affect you. And it sort of affects Revit. It's this. I'll, I'm going to show you where it is in here. See if I can find it under here. Under view, there's this choice called retina resolution, scaled, or best for retina. Okay. okay. You're going to choose scaled, and I'll tell you why. Retina resolution? Yeah, under retina resolution. And the reason is, on your fabulous machine, which has so many pixels, which is really, really good, yeah. okay, it just confuses Revit. Because okay. here's what happens. Usually, because you have like, oh, you know, 2,000 pixels by 4,000 pixels to have an awful lot of resolution, what happens is the Windows software says, oh, you know, the, the text would be so incredibly small, allow me to set myself to blow up the text to be 200% then you'll be able to see it better. Okay. The problem is that really freaks out Revit. So what happens is when you open up Revit, you'll see, oh, especially down here at the bottom where these little like, uh, like, like the status boxes are, it'll just, it, it, it zizzes. It kind of flickers in and out, and then some things in the menus don't show up properly. And if it's happening, like if your screen's just flickering a lot and behaving strangely, yeah. Remember back to this day, because that's what it is. It really is just something about the resolution stuff. So what we do is when we're working in Revit, we just you know downscale it. We don't use the full resolution. Okay, we just kind of pop it back in when you need it. Okay, so parallels will work for you. In terms of getting going, let me kind of point you to some sources that may help out. There is a site, there's actually a site called Bimtopia that I use for gathering and posting and sharing stuff that people are working on in class. So let me go out there for a second, because it also has information about getting your machine shut set up. So let's see what's out here. These are some design journals for uh, kind of the B class. People are putting things out there. In here, you will find, oh, there's links to the R class. You'll find uh, there's kind of links to all the old video sessions, which are also out there on YouTube, okay, as well as some student design journals. That's the idea that basically as you work and you're kind of completing your different projects, we'd like to put them in a place and share them so everyone can kind of see what they're like. We'll look at that in just a second. Over here, under Global AEC, Renata's class that some of you may know about, you know, we have a bunch of instructions for how you can set up you know, Windows on a Mac, how to install the Windows OS, how to configure your virtual machine, and how you actually install Revit. So there's a bunch of instructions out there. And what you can do is get parallels. Okay, that part's actually good. You know, there's some links. You should be able to get it for around $39, something like that. They always have a good academic deal. There's some links here that you can actually use to go out and grab it. Once you have parallels, what you tend to do next is just install the Windows OS. The good news is as Stanford students, you have access to Windows 10 absolutely free. So if you uh, download, let me find the link in here somewhere. I don't have, I do. Windows 10 Education. Okay, if you go to that site, is it there? I think you, you definitely, there's, it's, uh, there's the Stanford hub where you go and you get free software and you can like uh, basically download that. So are the steps to install Windows um, through the Stanford software licensing store? Yes. And then get Parallels? Actually, or get, all the way around? get Parallels first okay. and it'll just hang around. Then when you run Parallels, it'll want an image of Windows. Okay. Okay. And so simultaneously, you can download it here. This is Stanford Software Licensing, right in there. Stanford students can download Windows there. Yeah. You download that, that's gonna go ahead and create an image file on your disk. And then when you run Parallels, it'll say, hey, let me see if I can find an image file for you. And if it finds it, then it'll use it and install and create a Windows system for you. Okay, but go ahead and try that. And if you get any little hitches, it's always it's some little silly thing you have to do. You know, just let us know and we'll get you through it. It's actually, you know, I don't know. Everyone makes it through. <laughs> it takes a little bit of work. Everyone's machine's a little bit different. Okay. 
Then, once you get that installed, you're ready to go ahead and get rid of it. You should all sign up for something called an Autodesk ID. So, um, if you haven't had one in the past, you can sign up for one here at Autodesk Education Free Software All. If you do have one in the past and you had one for work, go ahead and sign up for a new one as a student anyway. Because as a student, you get all sorts of freebie privileges that at work they charge you for. So go ahead and get a free student ID. And then with that, you can then download and install the Revit software. Okay, and go out and grab that. And when you go through and run the install, you know, Jetpit is pretty dumb putting things together. Now, if you have any trouble installing Revit, you know, almost kind of installation hassles up front. Um, let me know. I'll give you a copy of the installer on a thumb drive. And that'll just save you the trouble of having to download it. And sometimes people have trouble downloading it just because of all the network protection software. You know, that's sometimes difficult. So, in fact, how about this? I'm going to. Do you have it downloaded yet? If you don't, I'm going to pull out my little installer guy. If I have it here. Right over here. And we could actually just copy this over to your machine too. Because that way you'll have it for when you have the windows available. Okay, so. Oh, this is actually, oh, you're getting ready to download Windows. You're doing good. This is actually the Revit installer. So I'm just going to give you a, a copy of the installation files. Oh, okay. That way you just don't have to download them in case uh, it's going to use trouble. So go ahead and pop that in and see if we can find it. I've gotten used to doing this because a lot of times it gives you this weird hassle about downloading through the web. Here it is. And under there, let me go down. Let's switch that so it's a list view. We'll see what I got in there. Say under BIM software installers, do I have it under there? That whole Actually, go ahead and yes, just copy that whole folder to your machine. Okay, give me that back when you're done. <laughs> okay, and then after you have Windows, you'll put that into your Windows environment and run it. Yeah, and it'll be exactly. And when you sign up for a Revit, it'll just send you an access code which looks like that. And it was like a one, two, three, three plus eight. I guess 11 digit codes. But somehow we'll get you through all that. Okay, so software, for the most part, will be okay. In terms of on um, these machines, kind of working, pretty much just log in as yourself. Revit 2016 generally will run just fine. We had an incident last week where the license server was down, so it was messing around with people for a couple days. But for the most part, log in and see if you can get to it. Okay, why don't you, actually, let me just check with where you guys are in the process. Hey. Was that? Oh no, come on in. Let's see where you are in the process just in terms of uh, getting started with it all. So, have you watched any of the videos yet? Have you opened and started playing with Revit yet? Or are you just getting started? Just getting started. Super, okay. Well, let's just open Revit and kind of play with it just real briefly, just to kind of kickstart you on the whole process. Again, I think you've seen it a little bit in like in the 100 class. You've seen some things like it in SketchUp, but let's just go ahead and open up some real simple models so we can actually uh, just get a sense of what it's like. Okay, so how about this? If you can, on the workstation here, just go ahead and log yourself in. I'll go ahead and bring up Revit on my side, just from scratch. Just take a look. Let me close some of these things up. I got too much stuff open. <coughs> oh, thank you much.
Okay, finally out to the main rivet window. And go ahead and open up rivet if you can. And see if you can do a window that looks like this. In this window, what you can see is you know, a lot of old projects that you've recently worked on, okay, or sample files for probably most of you in terms of what's going on. How about, you could go into the sample, but I'll let you do that on your own. Just you know, try creating some little things, just so that you sort of get a sense of uh, how all the menus work. We're going to make this a, a real small little house. That's kind of a, it's a good starting point, just to kind of like throw you into the deep end of the pool immediately. Uh -huh. It works. It's the best way. Okay, um, I'm going to choose something called the architectural template as a starting point. There's different templates that are full of, oh, come wall types and window types and some primitives that you can use to start pulling things together. So I'm going to start with architectural just because it has a lot of good things for architectural projects loaded in. Oh, later on, if we were doing a structure or doing a mechanical system, we can start with a different template. But we're going to hang out here. It's going to open up kind of a big white blank space called the drawing area. Okay. And then on the screen, let's just kind of walk you through where some of the different things are that you need to know about. This area up at the top of the screen up in here is called the ribbon. And like a lot of the Microsoft products, um, it has different tabs. So as you go clicking through different tabs, different choices of tools will show up there. And you usually start out on the architecture tab. That's usually a good space because a lot of what we do is on that tab. Kind of as you go further and further to the right, uh, it tends to be things you use less and less often. This area in the center that you sort of see these four little squares on, that's the drawing area. I think of that as a plan view of a space. Over here on the left-hand side, I'm showing something called the properties palette. And over here, I'm showing something called the project browser. Okay, And that's something that's easily configurable. But let me kind of show you how you work with it. You may be looking at them on yours as, as the properties and the project browser stacked up. I think that may be the way it opens by default. Yeah, they're stacked up on the left-hand side. Beautiful. Okay, so I organize it this way. It's strictly a matter of preference, just because I like to see more information over here. So I've separated the two. And how you do that, if you want to just get yourself set up the same way, is go ahead and I'll see if I can get it back to the way yours is right now. It probably looks, uh, let's see if I can get it like this. That's side by side. I get off the bottom. There it is. It probably looks like that. And to uh, separate them, what you do is just grab the little blue title bar. Hey. And pull it over to the right. So see if you can get that separated over there. That just is a, it's a nice way of working. Or at least it just opens up so you can start seeing things a little bit easier. Okay, so if it's at the top, uh, there you go. Just keep on, and then ultimately shove it off. It's going to sound weird. Just shove it off to the right. So in the middle of the right. So you got the top, kind of. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Okay, looking good. Now each of these different things over here are different. Most um, things that are available in the project. A lot of the ones up front are views or cameras on the project. So. We're going to do is draw things here and then navigate around between different views of what we draw over there. This part over here, the properties palette, is always going to show us information about anything that's selected. Okay. So as a starting point, oh, we'll think about drawing some oh, very simple little you know, doghouse-like thing, something pretty small. But we're going to go to the architecture tab, choose the wall tool. If you click on the wall tool, you'll see down here in the properties palette, we actually get some different wall information. There are actually several types of walls. The properties palette has a little something called a type selector at the top. So you can select different walls, everything from a generic wall, which doesn't have very many material properties, to more interior walls. All sorts of different wall types here. We're going to learn to create our own wall types to sort of reflect the type of things that we have here. I'm going to pull up a little and look at, we have some exterior walls here too. I'm going to go through and, oh, I'm going to choose a type of wall. It's called EIFS on metal stud. That'd be more for a commercial wall system, like expanded insulated foam system, something like that uh, on metal studs. It's kind of a lot of commercial buildings are built that way with metal walls as opposed to uh, wood frame walls and foam and stucco on the outside. 
so we'll just use that as a starting point. Again, we're going to learn more about that kind of in the sessions. We'll choose that as our type. We get to sort of choose this notion of how high our walls are. Are they going to go up to 20 feet, which is sort of an unconnected, sort of 20 feet tall always? Or we can choose to make them a specific height um, that's related to something else important on the project. And what I'm going to advise here is we're going to change them so they go up to level two, which is our kind of second floor level. That way, they'll always be connected to level two. And if level two changes, they'll change too. So I'll say, let's go to level two. Are you complaining at me? Oh, hang on. Didn't choose level two properly. Very good. Now I'm going to basically start drawing some walls. I'll ignore the other options for now, just so we kind of get something out quickly. And we'll say, hey, let's go ahead and I'm just going to draw some straight line segments. I'm going to be drawing straight lines because uh, I have a little straight line tool selected up here. They're going to chain together. That is, if I keep on clicking, it'll keep on putting new wall segments. And so if you can, you can create almost any shape you want to, but go ahead and complete the loop. I'm going to make a little L-shaped building. If you watch the videos, you're going to find out I always make little L-shaped buildings. Notice as I kind of get back over to this corner, oh, it sort of popped in with some blue lines, some inference lines that sort of basically told me that, hey, you're lining up, so that looked pretty good. Super. Now, don't worry too much about exactly where you place these things, because you could always click on one and see what the dimensions are that are locating it. You can drag that wall around if you want to, or you can even if the little dimension is blue, you can type in a new value. And just try moving some of your walls around. Okay, so just get a couple out there and kind of try sliding them around. You might notice as you click on any wall and it turns blue, information about it's displayed over in that thing over on the left-hand side of the properties palette. So yeah, then put the wall kind of going all the way through. Oh, that's a good one. Put a nice interior wall, break that space up. Um, yeah. If I like would want to extend this and remove this in order to extend that, sure. how? Well, let's let's try extending one. Go to the modify first. The little okay, and then click on the thing. But if you want to remove one, so let's select it. And now we'll backspace it. Okay. And now you can sort of stretch out. See how it has that little blue dot on the end? Stretch it on out. Okay. And now you can go through and add, if you go to the wall tool, you can add another segment to it. Okay, you got some nice interior walls. That's looking good. Notice it kind of is good, pretty good on the drafting. When you draw interior walls, it does what it'll call healing the different segments. So as you go moving through and drawing different things, um, it'll try to resolve all the corners. In this case, it's warning you that you're putting a second wall right on top of another one. In this case, let's just undo a couple more. Oh, no, sorry. Just uh, go back to modify. Try clicking right on there and backspace it. Okay, now try redrawing some more. Okay. Now hold that thought. You're doing pretty good. You got that. We got some basic walls drawn here. Okay. Hold that thought for a second. We'll finish this up. Now we've been drawing in this floor plan view, and in this floor plan view, things are working pretty good. Again, if we you know start putting some interior walls in. Um, we could change to a different type if we want to, or kind of keep the same type, also do generic wall for now. And I'll kind of just draw that across. I have some nice interior walls in here. It does a pretty good job of healing that up, as so I'm going to go through and create rooms. But you may be wondering, uh, you know, hey, I'm drawing these floor plan views. Is it really creating these 3D objects or not? And it is. You just don't sort of see it, but let's show you how you do. Okay. What we're going to do is going to open up something called the default 3D view. It'll show up over here in a moment, but to get started, 
Well, the easiest way is to go up to, if you look up in the, it's called the Quick Access Toolbar, there's this little thing way at the top that looks like a little dollhouse. Click on that. And you hopefully will see that a real 3D object is being drawn as you go. Super. Now, if you want to see both views simultaneously, because you actually do have a floor plan and a 3D view working together, what you can do is switch over to the View tab. And under the View tab, there's a choice here called Window Tiles, tiling the windows. And if you click on that, it'll actually put the two side by side. Now, if you can't see everything, you can use your mouse, roll with a little wheel to kind of zoom in or zoom out. Or if you hold the wheel down, it pans. But you can try now just sort of moving things in and out. And you'll see if you have anything selected in one view, although my screen's a little strange, I'll warn you about that. If I have it selected in one view, what's going to happen is it's going to select in the second view. And it's also going to show me the information in the third view. So really, every time you have something selected, all the information about it kind of is available. So you start by just getting some basic walls in there. Now, once you have some walls in there, you're looking pretty good that way. If you'd like to put some doors or windows in there, let's talk about how you do that. Under the Architecture tab, you'll actually find a door tool and a window tool. Now, doors and windows actually get placed in a very similar way. Walls were a little funny. You had to draw a line, and when you drew a line, it made a wall on that line. Doors and windows are examples of objects where you just click a, click a point, and it'll place a door or window at that point. So if you go to, for example, oh, let me do the door tool, and I'll see what kind of doors are available here. Nothing too awfully interesting, but we'll learn how to load some more in here. I just have different sizes of a door. Oh, maybe I'll put some 36-inch doors in. I'll cheese that. Now, I can go ahead and either do it in the floor plan view, or I can do it in the 3D view, either one. But if I want to put some doors in, I'll just put some doors in the walls. Notice as I'm putting the doors in the walls, a couple things are happening that are pretty smart. You know, it's not only sort of putting them in, in the floor plan view, but it's putting them in the 3D view. And as you put the door in, it's cutting away the wall that isn't needed. It's doing all the drafting cleanup. All that stuff we had to do in AutoCAD to kind of take care of uh, just making room for that door. So as you think about doors, it's kind of an interesting thing. I was almost watching as you were making your walls. Yeah. You don't need to leave a gap in the wall. What you do is actually draw the wall, then just drop an opening in the wall, which kind of seems counterintuitive, but it's almost the way we think about building it. We really do think about that whole wall being built, and then we just drop a door into it. Okay? So try putting a couple doors in there. Maybe if you want to also go to Windows and try putting some windows in, you'll see there's some, again, pretty boring windows right now, but you'll learn how to go through and load in some more interesting windows. But choose a size you like. I'm going to put windows in. Now, let me give you just one little nuance on windows to make you aware of. Windows actually have the notion of an inside and an outside. So there's an inside face and an outside face. And when you place windows, for this fixed window, it'll look pretty much the same. You won't be able to tell the difference. But let me show you what the difference is in terms of placement. If I'm hovering over the floor plan and I'm hovered just a little bit to the outside of the wall, that's going to indicate that's the outside of the window. So here I am, I'm in the floor plan, I'm hovering, I'm basically going to click, not just right on the wall, I'm going to click just to the side of the wall, which is the outside. Okay? And that'll make the window orient so that the exterior is facing the exterior of the building. So if I did this, it would be sort of inside out, the window would be facing to the inside. So just to the outside. Put 
some more windows in here. Now, if you ever get a window that's inside out, and that happens to us a lot, you always have the option of this. If you click on a window, and it'll be selected over here, it'll also be selected over here and over here, there's a little series of little blue arrows, little flippy arrows, which are a glyph that allow you to flip that window inside out. So if you ever want to reverse the direction, if you select the window, then click the uh, arrows, it'll flip it inside out. And that's actually a very common thing. For example, on doors we do that a lot. So for example, I have this door over here. I've selected the door. Notice I have a couple of little arrows. I have a swing it this way or that way. I have which side it hinges on. And also, does it go in or does it go out? So you can always flip those things around. doing that. So one of the high level things I want you to get used to in Revit is that it's really hard to go wrong in it. You can put things down almost anywhere and then adjust them. And that's really a good way of working. So at any point, if things just aren't exactly the way you want them, you select the object and you adjust its parameters that sort of either make it taller or shorter or change the type or whatever it is. So for example, even here, I've put in um, some big windows if I want to change that later. I can choose the window, and then just choose another type of window to replace that with. Okay, and I'll swap it in there. So we've been working along here in these different windows, or in these different views. We have, oh, also some elevations that are being created as we go. Okay, but that's all you really need to know to get going with the whole thing is that open Revit. You can start placing doors, walls, windows, and stuff like that. Um, as you go through the uh, videos, you learn more about floors and roofs. But that's enough to get you going on the first assignment. Depends what it is. So just look at it, have some fun thinking about what 500 square feet of a field research station could look like, and then just play with it and see like uh, what you can get to. The idea is really just to gain some experience. We're just kind of creating a very basic little building and uh, just uh, seeing if you can get it realized. When we get together next time when we review things, we'll talk about how all these views within the 3D model actually end up on sheets that we can kind of share with each other. Okay, so let's just kind of switch for today there, but hopefully that's enough to get you going. And again, if you have any troubles with installations or any need of computer configuration advice, just holler and we'll, somehow we'll all get through it. And everyone will be a slightly different uh, struggle, but we'll all make it through. Okay, go have yourself a great day. Thank you so much.